Welcome everybody to uh, this DDEX webinar, um, <clears throat> which is actually taking place in November, despite what that slide says, our apologies. Um, my name is Mark Isherwood, and I am here with my colleague Niels Rump, uh, both of us from the DDEX Secretariat. Um, and we are going to be talking about uh, music metadata today, how you use metadata to describe music, and also talk about some of the fundamental principles that underpin the way in which um, the DDEX standards are structured and the way in which we um, uh, use data structures to describe music um, in, in all its many forms. So I will give a very brief overview of, of DDEX in case there is anybody who doesn't know what DDEX is. I think that's unlikely. And then talk about what metadata actually is. And then in particular, talk about a project which is now well over a decade old, um, but which may seem in the sort of internet age uh, to uh, be behind the times, but actually is fundamental to the way DDEX is structured. And not only DDEX, but a number of other um, metadata activities around the world in different media industries. Um, and then I'll talk about, um, and between me and Niels, we'll talk about two fundamental concepts that came out of the index project, the model of commerce and the model of making. Uh, and then Niels will, uh, I don't think he'll be talking about fingerprints and watermarks, but I think that's a, another error. Um, but we'll talk about how um, metadata uh, is used within the DDEX standards. Of course, please ask questions uh, as we go along. We will try and answer them either as we as we go through or uh, at the end. Um, just put your questions in the chat and we will keep an eye on that. So, um, Briefly about DDEX. DDEX is a standards organization operating primarily in the music industry. And um, our goal is to make the communication of data along the music industry value chain more efficient uh, and more cost effective. Uh, we do this in three ways, we, three areas that we standardize. Uh, the most common one is the actual format of computer messages that um, business partners can implement between them. And basically that sets out the order in which various different data elements should appear in the message and some of the relationships between the different data elements so that they can be interpreted by the receiver of the message uh, properly and ingested into the recipient's systems. Um, we also define choreographies, which is uh, essentially the order in which messages should take place um, or should be exchanged rather in, in a particular business transaction. Um, many of the standards have more than one message format um, in order to complete a particular business transaction. And obviously um, everybody needs to know what order those those should um, be exchanged in and what the trigger points are for, for that to happen. And then lastly, we define the actual message protocols by which the, the messages get exchanged. Um, up until recently, that has been primarily using secure FTP sites where we define things like directory structures and file name and conventions. But increasingly, the industry is moving towards um, web services, um, which is much more automated, where uh, computers do a lot more of the heavy lifting and there's, there's less need for human intervention. Uh, and that is a trend that uh, we believe is, is going to continue uh, increasingly over the next few years. Um, DDEX is now pretty ubiquitous. We've issued well over six and a half thousand implementation licenses. Um, DDEX doesn't document actual information about implementation, so we have limited data on the front, but we do know, obviously, that uh, the VAR, all of our members have implemented one or more of the DDEX standards, and that means they've done that with their business partners. So um, if you want to be a serious player in the music industry these days, you really do need to have implemented uh, one or more of the DDEX standards. 
and uh, here is a sort of a map of the various standards that we have. Uh, I'm not going to go through them in any detail, but as you can see, all of the major types of companies uh, within the industry have available to them a standard defined by DDEX, which they can use for uh, one or more of their different types of business transactions. Um, and um, although there are obviously and always will be some gaps, um, pretty much every kind of transaction that needs to take place right across the industry is catered for um, within um, the list of standards that DDEX has, has uh, defined. At the core of um, DDEX is our data dic dictionary. Um, we call it the lingua, lingua franca of the music industry. Um, and in some ways it is a language uh, as much as anything else. Um, so if you are uh, wanting to send data in uh, a DDEX format, you have to kind of translate your data model into DDEX so that you can actually create a DDEX formatted message. And then at the other end, the recipient has to translate the DDEX message into their, D their data uh, format so that they can understand what the sender uh, is, is communicating to them. Um, so essentially the, the, the mechanism in the middle there is the language of DDEX that both parties speak, even though their data model models may well be quite different. <coughs> Excuse me. So the data dictionary is kind of the beating heart of DDEX and contains the semantics of uh, and all the terms, tags and allowed values that exist uh, within all the, the messages um, and the syntax and um, and the structure of, main, of the main composites. Um, just briefly, uh, composites are um, a series of different data elements that uh, together help describe uh, things like sound recordings or musical works, common things within the industry. Uh, and they are very much um, a building block for all of the standards. So the way in which a sound recording is described in one standard will be pretty much the same in, in all the other standards. Similarly, things like musical works or, or parties. Um, and they so that you can see from that that, that we reuse uh, quite a lot of elements in order to to put the the standards together. So turning to metadata um, and um, using the fount of all knowledge Wikipedia, um, metadata is data that provides information about other data, but it's not the content of the data itself, uh, such as the text of a message or the or or an image. And there are many distinct types of metadata. Descriptive metadata, which um, obviously is used to, to, to describe things, as you would imagine. Uh, structural data, uh, metadata, administrative metadata, which may be you know, um, personal information about um, a, a person. Reference metadata, which is more static in the sense that it's not going to change. So that might be something like the title of a work and its composers. Other things about the, the musical work may change, like who owns the rights. But the, the reference data, the reference metadata, the title and the songwriters stay the same. Obviously, statistical metadata, uh, huge amount of statistic governance government statistics and then legal metadata which uh, sort of explains itself um, but metadata isn't really bounded by any of these because it can be used to describe anything anything you like in in as many ways as you like and some examples of this so obviously library catalogs you probably don't see uh, drawers of cards very often anymore. It's all on computers, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, signs within museums describing um, uh, items of antiquity. Even a barcode is a form of metadata. Um, your ID card, your passport is, is, is metadata. 
so is the label in your clothes. Um, it's all about providing information about the thing that it's attached to, in this case, uh, um, a piece of clothing. And then simple things that, you know, although most of us haven't seen one of these for probably two years, um, airport departure displays is also uh, a piece of metadata um, describing um, a, a, a flight that is about to take place. Now applying that to music, obviously um, the title of a song or a sound recording is metadata. All of the names of the contributors, the lists of tracks on an album, the price of an album, um, who has bought an album on a, on a digital music service, how many streams of a particular track have taken place, uh, the name and address of the recording studio where the where one of the tracks was originally recorded. All of this is is music metadata, uh, and within the context of DDEX, we have to be able to describe all of those elements and more uh, in a way that is unambiguous. So let's look at a little bit of ambiguity. The string of letters that spell out "Let it be." immediately for those of us of a certain age um, immediately conjures up the work let it be by the Beatles however um, it is also a recording uh, and so the same title applies to the individual recording as well as to the musical work and taking it one step sorry one step further there is of course the album let it be so which of those things, entities, is that string of letters actually describing or identifying. Um, and because it could be any one of those three, the sort of work that we have to do is to make sure that it is absolutely clear um, when that piece of information is communicated to a business partner, which uh, entity that string is describing or identifying. And so in comes this project, the index project, interoperability of data in e-commerce systems. It was an EU uh, pro uh, project coming out of what was called the Info 2000 program. And it took place um, across the millennia, millennium rather, uh, between 1999 and 2000. And it developed at least two very fundamental models that underpin the way in which we approach um, the development of the DDEX standards. And these two things are known as the model of making and the model of commerce. And so at this point, I'm going to hand over to Niels, who will describe these things in a bit more detail and how we apply them um, within the context of DDEX. Uh, Niels. Good, thank you. And good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Mark, for for the introduction of all of this. So let's talk about um, the index commercial model first. Um, and it all starts out with these three little sentences that you can see on the screen here. Pe people make stuff, people use stuff, people do deals about stuff. The term stuff it sounds rather colloquial, I do agree, um, but it's actually um, kind of a, a term of art, at least those who, who live and breathe the index uh, model. Um, we use that term all the time to describe sound recordings, books, pictures, all the, um, the resources, all the, the, the art that we're dealing with on a daily basis. So people make these things, they make this stuff, they use this stuff, and they make deals about stuff. And then there's a corollary saying that the stuff and the deals may come in any order. So I can make a deal about stuff that doesn't even exist. Um, but of course, people come first. Um, in a depicted way, it is this. People make stuff, people do deals about stuff, 
um, and people use this stuff. Those arrows that you see there, um, they have, they're monodirectional in this diagram, but in reality, they are, of course, bidirectional. So people do deals, but it's also that deals are done by people. And these white rectangles that you see there, these are verbs, these are the actions that happen. Um, and these will come back um, and, and we will need to talk more about them because it's actually these actions that is the critical um, aspect of describing all of this. Because clearly what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to describe those people, those deals, those stuffs, as well as the events around people, deals and stuff. If we can't do that, then we, we, we can't really describe music, then we can't really describe commerce about music. Um, and with commerce, um, while that has a rather monetary um, sound to it, um, it's not necessarily meant uh, like this. So whether there is actually commercial interactions of people with stuff doesn't really matter. Even if I, I, I'm having a, a free concert somewhere, um, I still have kind of a deal with the, with the people around it that I play music and they listen. So there's still um, those things. So it's not just about money, but certainly it's all about, as well, all about being able to enable music to be traded online, because that was in the end, the, the whole underpinning of what the index project tried to do but more than 20 years ago, I'm afraid, Mark, it's not 10 years, it's 20 years, um, more than 20, um, that um, that tr triggered all of the, 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 the revolution of music distribution online that we've experienced in that time. But what does describing means? Well, describing means associating metadata, um, associating these composites of metadata that Mark spoke about to people, to stuff, to deals, um, and to those individual verbs that are listed there. And the index model basically has four types of metadata. Now, DDEX has further refined this, and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, but but the, the index model originally had labels, types, quantities, and qualities that it wanted to associate with an individual item of interest. Labels, that's names, that's identifiers. Types, so you have things like, um, hey, here is a um, here is an entity. Is it a work? Is it a party? If it's a party, is it even a composer or is it a um, recording artist? Those kind of things. That's what computers actually need to work properly. Quantities like how long is that uh, sound recording? What's the price of the release that you want to um, trade and make it available to consumers? And then you have qualities, things like the language used. Um, is it a low definition video or a high definition video? Are we talking about immersive sound or just a stereo recording or a mono recording even? Those kind of things, well, you need to be able to describe that. Briefly leaving um, the music, looking at um, the text publishing world, um, you have the same thing. And interestingly enough, the, the main standards body for the text publishing industry, editor, they use the same underpinning, the same index model for the description of their metadata, as does the music industry using DDEX. Because it ha the, the, the index model has, has proven to be that powerful to actually help describe all of these um, trade and, 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 and commercial relationships between the different entities. So you can see here, you have Das Kapital, um, you have a special ISBN number. That obviously is not the real one. The real one doesn't fit on this on the screen. Um, it's a hardcover for 798, um, 89. Um, it's in German and it's a reprint of the original um, edition with a leather cover. There you go. That's one example of describing an entity. But you not only need to describe this, you also then need to link it to other entities. In this case, the entity of Karl Marx, who wrote the whole thing between 1865 and 1867 in London. 
and you can then describe what the relationships of these th these different entities, Karmax and Das Kapital, are with respect to that event. So the book is the output, the person is the agent that created the um, the output, and then you have a specific time and a specific place. That's really the, the 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 crucial bit that we need to be able to describe, not just for books, but for music as well. And what are these events that we're talking about? Let me give you some examples. And obviously, there are thousands more that you can describe. The use of a resource by a consumer. So a consumer has used a resource, um, has paid money for it. Uh, it happened in a specific territory for a specific price. A, a specific resource was used. Maybe that's a user in a specific um, user group, which then triggers a specific license agreement. Well, yeah, so we use this in the DSR message. Now, if you're using exactly the same pieces of information, a specific release, a specific country, a specific type of use, and describe it as a future use, well, you're talking about the ERN message, isn't it? It's the same data, but in a different context. It's a future use rather than a past use. And you can then spin it even further and have exactly the same kind of use as part of a future deal between a label and a publisher regarding um, the, the use of a specific recording. So we're using basically the same data again in the musical work licensing standard MWL um, to describe similar um, events. And that's where these composite that Mark talked about are so important, because if, if the data is the same, shouldn't things look similar in, in the messages? They can't be the same because there are specific uh, uh, differences. For example, in DSR, you may have a time point when that happened, whereas in ERN, it's in the future. So you can't have a specific time point. On the other hand, you can have a start date for a deal, which doesn't really apply to the DSR and those kind of things. But in principle, describing them in a common way is, is, is appropriate. And that's why DDEX then took the index model and refined it. And we use now five different types of data, um, as opposed to the, the original four. We have still have descriptors, we have categories, we have quantities, time, and links on those latter three. I'll come to in a second. But descriptors, they're basically all those labels. And they're identifiers, they're names, and they're annotations. Um, and these are basically in decreasing order of strictness, if you like. Identifiers, they should be unique. Ideally, they are. Not always, but that's the idea. Um, each entity has its own um, identifier, and it's the only one that has that identifier. With names, not so much. Um, as Mark has said, let it be can be three different things and more. And then annotations, which is non-referential, free-form text, um, like the C line, um, thousands of recordings have the same C line. Um, yeah, that's that's just fluffy metadata, if you like. Still important for some cases, but it's not as stringent as names or certainly identifiers. Categories, that's the core for, for the computers, where you classify a specific um, resource as a sound recording or as a musical work sound recording or as an immersive sound, um, immersive audio sound recording. Um, then you have qualities like, like language and, and certainly Boolean flags, for example. And then we also have, as I said, quantities, which is just numeric data, times and links, which is basically linking those entities with one another. And that's, again, one of the most important things of the entire model. And that then enables us to describe stuff, people, contexts, and places. Stuff we've already talked about. People is obvious. People also includes um, companies, um, which is why this thing should actually say party rather than people. Um, Places is also obvious. Context, that's basically those verbs um, that we've talked about. 
and I'll come back to those in a, in a moment. Now, one other thing that I'd like to highlight is the differentiation between, or the difference between annotations and classifications. Annotations, freeform strings, very nice, very good for humans because we've got the brain to actually post these things and, and put them into, into different categories. That's what our brain um, has learned in, in those uh, millions of years of, of, um, of evolution. They're not so good for computers. Computers need uh, specific um, terms, specific strings with specific meaning um, that then programmers and users of the system can, can use to, to, to make decisions on and, and act upon. So a C line, freeform text, humans can read it, can derive information from it. A computer can't. A computer can derive information from its specific use type or a specific resource type. If you want to learn more about annotations and classifications, specifically those um, classifications, um, we've got a um, webinar on our YouTube channel as well as available through the DDEX website about allowed value sets. It's the webinar from last month, um, and I'll encourage you to, to have a look at this. Let me, though, have a look at an example of how to actually this plays out in, in the real world. So let's, let's have as an example the download of a release by a consumer from a specific day in a country for a price. Whether that is now in the future, so it's an ERN that allows this, or whether that's in the past, so it's a DSR saying this has happened, or whether that's as part of a licensing deal where a um, label says, this is what I'd like to do. Can I have a license for such a download? Doesn't really matter. This is what we need to describe. So there's the use that we want to describe. Well, it's of a specific type. It's a download, isn't it? We know that there is a specific price point, whether that's actually quantity of a, of a, of a monetary value or whether it's a, another, um, a uh, type of a budget versus frontline, and then there's some kind of other mechanism to determine the price. That doesn't matter, but I'll use the quantity here. And you have a specific time. So far, so good. You then, of course, need to link the specific resource, in this case, the release, to that event. This is the event that may be downloaded or has been downloaded at 5.95 from the 1st of January onwards. And that release itself has all the different ways to describe it. It has an identifier, it has a name, it has a C line. Um, it may have um, a, a type which says that it's a, um, a stereo sound recording, all of those bits. And again, those bits are being described in a DDEX message as a composite. But the way we create the composite is informed by this model so that we make sure that all the critical elements are always available. The use then still needs to say where it is, a country, which itself has further attributes, um, such as an identifier. The ISO territory list is basically an identifier for a, ter uh, for a country, for a territory. And then you can list uh, the consumer. In reality, in none of those three cases, ERN, DSR, or the licensing message, is a consumer being um, mentioned. Though in the DSR, in, in some ways, um, you could narrow things down to an individual mm -hmm. consumer uh, transaction, if that's what people want to. I don't think it's used in that way uh, at all is the data would simply be too much. But of course, you then also need to link from the release to actually the, the recording artist or the artist under whose name that release is being published. And I'm not showing all the resources that are being, um, that are part of that release, which have their own ID, name, etc and the structure of describing a resource and the structure of re describing a release is remarkable similar. Why? 
first of all, we want to reuse um, structures as much as possibly. And secondly, because of this very model that, that we're using to, to make sure that we capture all the data that needs to be captured. So then you have the recording, uh, the, the individual resources, which then have artists hanging off them because you have the, the, the individual musicians that played on that recording, who then have an identifier, hopefully in ISNI, uh, a name, um, the territory in which they were born or they're a, a, a national of, um, the location where they are being, um, where they were born, by the way, this being born, that's another verb, that's another context, which has links to the country where it was uh, born, to the artist itself and so forth. So you can see that this becomes a web of the individual um, resources and actions or contexts, as we call them, to, to make sure that um, all the data is being captured. And this brings me then to the to the second um, crucial contribution that the index project has made to to our lives uh, and the lives of actually most musicians without them understanding that. And why should they? Um, and that's the model of making. Um, to me, this may be even more important than the model, the commerce model. Um, it's really fundamental to understanding the music industry value chain. Um, it's complex, yet also very simple once you actually can, can see through the, the various boxes. Let me scare you first and show you um, the full model. Um, yes, that's complex, isn't it? Um, but if we're focusing on on three things, it still looks right, uh, quite complex. Um, but it's not really. If if I overlay terminology that we're used to, then then it looks actually much simpler, much much more straightforward. You have a musical work, the thing that somebody conceives, somebody in their in their head thinks about a new composition, uh, a new lyrics, or whatever it may be. Um, it doesn't exist anywhere apart from his or her uh, brain at that moment, up until there is a performance. So somebody sings that very work or somebody writes it down. The process of writing down the, the clef and the five lines and the staves and, and all of that bit, that action of performing, if you like, the work, sounds odd to say writing it down is a performance, but from the model, it actually is. Um, and if they're writing it onto a piece of paper rather than a pen on, uh, into the air, if you like, at that stage, you then have created an artifact. You have actually fixated the work on a piece of paper. Or if you're singing it and you're singing it into a microphone uh, on, onto which you have, to which you have connected a, a, a tape or a a computer these days, um, at that stage, you actually have made a an artifact, a sound recording, which then can be uh, instantiated into all the MP3 files that exists uh, of that recording, hopefully when thousands of people have, have uh, bought or downloaded or streamed that that recording. So it's these three core entities, the, the abstraction, let me go back, the abstraction, the musical work, the expression, the performance, and the manifestation, the, the file uh, on the server where you, or the, the tape containing the, the bits on the tape representing the sound made based on the musical work, that are the three crucial um, creation types that we need, need to deal with. Quite interesting and, and important to note is that the manifestation, the sound recording, is not what an ISRC identifies. The ISRC identifies the expression. The singing of the song is identified through the ISRC 
not the bits on the tape. And that's quite quite an um, quite an interesting, um, sometimes subtle differentiation, but an important one. So if we're then going back to the, the full model of making, um, you can see the same thing as here, as, as in, in the previous slide on the right there. Um, there's just one additional thing added to this, which is the event, in this case, the recording or the writing event of that abstraction. You would have basically the same on, on that could have the same on other bits on this diagram. But there you have the event where you have it, which happens at a specific time. So I am now recording, or we are now recording this, this webinar. So there is a there is a concept, there's an abstraction, which is the, the whole concept of what I want to talk about. We have the event, me expressing that concept. Now, where is it? Well, I'm doing it here in, in Southeast London. Who are the parties? Well, I'm one of the parties as the talker. Um, you guys all are parties to this event. You are the talkies, if that exists, so that the people who are listening to the event. Um, and we are creating a manifestation as part of this because Mark at the beginning of the webinar pressed the record button. And once this video is then uploaded to YouTube, you will all be able to download an item of this and revisit this and, and have, an, have a specific um, MP4 file, I assume, on your, your hard disk, either streamed or permanently. So this model is, is really uh, fundamental to, to, to the understanding of, of music. Uh, metadata or any kind of metadata in any kind of creative industry. The book industry, as I said earlier, is doing the same thing. Now, um, let's quickly talk about fingerprinting and watermarks. Um, because one thing that we need to make sure of is that we're linking the metadata that we've now done. We've described the sound recordings, the resources, the releases. Um, in a, in a good way, in a structured way, so that we're sure that we've covered all the basics. Um, but how do we make sure it actually links to the individual items that we're talking about, the reference? Um, now, first of all, I would say that metadata best lives in a database. Directly embedding the metadata into the content is is a dangerous thing to do. Um, some for some database, uh, some metadata, it's fine. Uh, but for other metadata, especially especially when it comes to to um, ownership information, um, information that changes over time, information that is commercially sensitive, because as long as it's as soon as it's in the meta in the sorry in the resource itself. You can strip it out or you can change it. So nobody really wants to rely on the data that's in the file. The only way you can rely on it is if it's in, in a database that has good governance, good structure, maybe that you own yourself or that you know is, is reliable um, as a resource for the industry. That applies for people as well as context, as well as places, as well as the stuff itself. But we need to link them. Now, fingerprints and watermarks can help there. Not so much for people, not so much for context, not so much for places, but at least for stuff. But because we need to link it to all of those um, entity types, just relying on fingerprints and watermarks doesn't work anyway. But I do think we should use fingerprints and watermarks um, to, to help us do that. So fingerprints, where you basically take a, roughly speaking, a hash sum of a sound recording, for example, which then links to a specific entity in the database. And whether that entity then links to the musical work that has been recorded or the sound recording itself, or maybe the releases in which that sound recording appears, or 
the, the releases in which the musical work of that sound recording appears is of a secondary nature. And it may be several hops that you need to do from database to database. But that is certainly one way. Equally, using a watermark to embed an identifier into a sound recording is a, is a, is a useful thing to do. That makes it much easier to then hit the database and find out all the data that you need to know about. And hopefully that data is structured in a way that um, it covers all the basics as we've been discussing over the last um, half hour or so. So what I want to um, would like you to all take away is that careful modeling of the data is essential. Um, if you don't do the basics right, um, you're in all likelihood screwing things up for you. Maybe not today, but tomorrow. Again and again, we've seen people, for example, confusing works and recordings and not separating them out properly. That works well as long as you are, you're a small record company, for example, that only deals with um, music where the writer is also the, the performing artist. But as soon as that person makes the, the recording artist makes a cover version, you now need to differentiate between the song, now I'm using the word song myself, the, the musical work and the recording, um, because there are different rights holders involved. There are different people that need to be paid as soon as that um, recording is being monetized. So don't use the word song because it mean can mean either. And make sure that your your modeling is 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 rich enough for it to carry carry all information. By the way, the word song, of course, you can use it in in colloquial discussions, and if you want to be ambiguous, but as soon as it gets to talking about metadata and talking properly, I would always suggest to use musical work or work and recording to separate them. And you can, of course, also cut corners in the development of your, your systems. For example, the DDEX model um, calls out, or, or rather the index model, calls for um, times to be entities on their own. We've not done that because times are not that critical for DDEX. So we have just made it a, a data attribute to, to all the other entities wherever necessary. But we, can do, oh, but we made that in the, in the clear knowledge of why we are able to cut these corners. So cutting corners is fine as long as you know the consequences. And last but not least, and while I put that slide up, um, if you have any questions, please start um, either typing them into the chat um, or, or maybe even open your microphone and we can have a discussion in a moment. Um, I would really suggest you have a look at the index metadata framework principle model and data dictionary document. Um, that's basically the outcome of that EU project that Mark has mentioned at the beginning. Um, it was written by um, two former colleagues of, of Mark's and myself, uh, Gottfried Rust and Mark Bide, and you see a URL there. But if you just look for index, spelled with a CS, not an X, um, metadata framework, you should be able to um, find your, use your favorite search engine and, and find the document that I'm referring to. That is what I had to say, what I wanted to say. If there is anything further that um, that you would like to touch, whether you have a question, please do not hesitate to ask, either now or later. Does anybody have any questions? Well, if you uh, think of something later please email us at info at ddex.net uh, and we will obviously do our very best to answer um, this uh, webinar has been recorded and will be on uh, the resource and press page of the main D 
DDEX website at DDEX.net uh, within the next couple of days. So if you do want to revisit this, um, that's where you will be able to find it. Um, and also if you go to the events tab on uh, DDEX.net, you will see that there is another um, set of webinars in December where we are going to be talking about the identification of venues. So if you want to sign up for that, uh, please follow the various links on the website. Um, absent any questions, um, we will finish the webinar. Thanks very much for attending. I hope you found it helpful uh, and enjoy uh, the rest of your day where, wherever you are. Thanks very much. Thank you.